Okay, in our previous lecture, we would developed the most of the basic equations for isotropic hardening in a, in a 1D um, bar. Uh, we had left an open-ended question of, uh, in the case of hardening, we know that the yield stress, sigma y, evolves in uh, as a function of uh, uh, plastic strain. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how, how does that come about. So I'll just write down what that yield function looked like. Right, and remember, we just defined that as F is equal to, uh, we said the simplest case would be the magnitude of the stress minus the yield stress sigma y. And we had posed the question, how does this yield stress change? And we wanted to ask specifically, how does it change during yielding? We know that when yielding's not happening, nothing happens to sigma y. But for just a refresher, let me let me draw the the uh, sort of the relevant diagram from a stress strain perspective that we're going to use to identify that kind of the key features here. So that's uh, strain and there's stress. We have the initial elastic load up to some some location. We'll just call that sigma naught. That's where the onset of yielding happens. And then we harden. We get stronger uh, up to some whatever point we decide to unload from, and then we unload. And then we unload back along the same line. And we said that the unloading line was the elastic modulus, and it's the same as the loading line. So the Young's modulus, the elastic modulus, uh, doesn't change during the yield process. Uh, the onset of yield is at sigma naught, and then at some point along here, we have what is the yield, the yield stress or the flow stress, sigma y. And at some point, any point along here, we can define a tangent modulus. So let's do that. So the tangent modulus is at the point uh, uh, during a yield process, so E tan. Okay, and recall too that we had uh, previously defined the f uh, via the flow rule the relationship between plastic strain and um, uh, total strain. And, and what we'd shown was that the, the plastic strain increment d epsilon p was going to be equal to uh, this quantity E minus E tan divided by E times the total strain increment d epsilon. Uh, or in the rate form, we had that epsilon P dot would be equal to E minus E tan divided by E times epsilon dot. That's the total strain. And, and of course, this occurs only uh, when yielding is happening. So this is just during yield. OK, recall also that we had a constitutive law. Our constitutive law said that the increment in stress, d sigma, is going to be equal to uh, the modulus E times the increment of elastic strain, d epsilon, uh, sub E, so to indicate it's elastic, and then we can use our strain decomposition to write that that uh, elastic strain increment is just the total strain increment minus the plastic strain increment. Okay? So, during during yielding, uh, sigma, the, the stress, is equal to the yield stress. Okay, so in that case, we can write the following, that D sigma y is equal to E uh, times d epsilon minus d epsilon p. Okay, So remember, we're trying to figure out how the yield stress sigma y evolves as a function of plastic strain. So in order to do that, we need to be able to write that d epsilon term in terms of plastic strain, which we just showed above, could be written as uh, if we just, uh, instead of writing it as d epsilon p equals that, that uh, ratio times d epsilon, we can just invert that ratio and write that d epsilon is equal to e over uh, e minus e tan times d epsilon p. So then this quantity here, we can pull the epsilon p out and say that's e times e over e minus e tan minus 1 times d epsilon p. Hopefully that's straightforward. Okay, so 
we can now uh, uh, take that and continue to do some simplification on it right inside inside that uh, parenthesis we can we can uh, make a common denominator and write it as e minus now the quantity e minus e tan divided by e minus e tan okay our e's cancel out and we're just left with a positive e tan up here so this whole thing oops let me write that that's d epsilon let's write that this is d epsilon p there still we can we can do the combination there and find that we reduce this whole thing to e times e tan divided by e minus e tan times d epsilon p so our total equation that we're trying to work with then is d sigma y is equal to uh, e times e tan divided by e minus e tan times d epsilon p okay so if we wanted to get sigma y now as a as a function uh, of epsilon p and, and not in differential form we just need to integrate so we can say that integrating gives right and we can integrate this left hand side of d sigma y from the initial value of sigma y is just sigma naught and then the final value is whatever sigma y happens to be and then on the other side when we integrate we have this integral here of e times e tan divided by e minus e tan times d epsilon p and initially epsilon p is zero when when sigma is equal to sigma naught and then at the final case it's just whatever epsilon p is equal to okay um, so we can integrating this is simple it just this just becomes sigma y minus sigma naught and I can pull the sigma naught to the other side and write that uh, I have sigma y now uh, is going to be equal to sigma naught plus the integral from 0 to epsilon p of e minus e uh, sorry e times e tan divided by e minus e tan and d epsilon p okay so if this is the simplest that we can make it uh, in the case of uh, a, a variable tangent modulus but if we just had a straight line tangent modulus um, then we can pull that that uh, ratio out and we can write the following so if uh, e tan is constant during yielding and what we mean by that is that it's independent of the plastic strain okay then we can write that sigma y now as a function of epsilon p is equal to sigma naught plus e times e tan divided by e minus e tan times epsilon p okay that seems convenient and it looks like we've we've gotten somewhere but there's actually a problem this equation uh, would show a decrease in the yield stress uh, if I had a if I put a compressive strain on it. If if epsilon p became negative, I would actually I could achieve a, a yield strength that would be less than the initial sigma naught value, uh, and that's that's not going to be correct. So how how can we go about correcting that? So the way we correct it is that instead of talking about the plastic strain, we introduce something called an effective plastic strain. And we define it as just epsilon p now with a bar over the top to indicate that it's effective. And we define it as in the incremental form that d epsilon p with the effective plastic strain is going to be equal to just the magnitude of d epsilon p. Uh, or we could write that as the square root of d epsilon p times d epsilon p. Okay. So what you notice is that the increment of the effective plastic strain is always positive regardless of the sign of the plastic strain. We could write that uh, if we wanted to uh, using the rate form 
and write that the effective plastic strain epsilon p is equal to the integral from zero to t of the magnitude of the plastic strain rate dt uh, or which is going to be equal to equivalently integral from zero to t of the square root of the plastic strain rate times itself okay dt right so that would those would be ways we could represent the plastic strain rate so if we do that then we can go ahead and modify our equation for the yield stress to to basically be a function of instead of the plastic strain make it simply a function of the effective plastic strain okay so it looks exactly the same as what we had before we just made that substitution but i'm going to make the note that unlike epsilon p the effective plastic strain epsilon p bar can only increase and and it can only increase regardless of the sign of epsilon p okay so this new equation uh, actually represents what we call the hardening curve so if we were to draw this it's going to look kind of like a stress strain plot but it's not and i'll remind you that again so in on the x-axis we'll have the effective plastic strain and on the y-axis we'll have the yield strength and of course it begins at some value that sigma naught and it grows something like this so this initial value is sigma naught and that occurs when there's no plastic strain and there's going to be a slope to this curve this tangent to the curve which we'll call h and we'll define as the what's called the plastic modulus now the plastic modulus uh, is is defined very simply by h is equal to just the tangent modulus of this curve which is going to be d sigma y so the increment of the yield strength over d epsilon p bar right which we already know what that is uh, because we we defined it uh, in the previous uh, uh, set of slides it's just that slope e times e tan divided by e minus e tan and let's uh, let's try to stay consistent I'll put this tan uh, as as a subscript okay so again remember this is not a stress strain curve right the plastic modulus h uh, describes the evolution of the yield stress or the yield surface with plastic strain sometimes it's convenient as well to um, solve for the tangent modulus which is what we could measure off a stress strain curve uh, uh, and we we could we could put that in in terms of the plastic modulus so let me do that quickly so essentially we just we just uh, uh, just carry out the algebra which looks like e minus e tan times h is going to be equal to e times e tan right and we can show rapidly that uh, that we can write then that e tan it's going to be equal to e times h divided by e plus h and it's sometimes convenient to write this in a different form and i'll show you why here in just a second because uh, it's it's sometimes convenient to write e tan as e minus uh, e squared over e plus h and I'll, I'll just leave that algebra to you it's not very difficult um, but but the reason is that now uh, we have this this uh, relationship that if we were in the elastic regime we could kind of just turn off that second term and our tangent modulus would be the same as as our original elastic modulus modulus which is sometimes convenient sometimes it's convenient to to uh, use what's called a plastic switch parameter we define that switch parameter as phi mm -hmm. and what it does is we, it lets us turn off and on plasticity so we write this then as e tan is equal to e now minus phi the plastic switch parameter times e squared divided by e plus h so 
what that effectively does is if let's say for example we're, we've stopped yielding now we're unloading we want our tangent modulus to switch back to our to our normal elastic modulus uh, which we can we, which we can readily do then by just turning this from from a one to a zero so during the plastic this plastic switch parameter is simply a zero or a one so it's one during plastic deformation and it's zero otherwise okay so that kind of completes uh, what you need to know uh, uh, with respect to isotropic hardening and developing the equations that are needed to actually solve the problem. Uh, I, the, the, the exact solution, of course, depends on what the load history is here. So you'd have to actually solve it in, in its incremental form uh, to get to get what, let's say, uh, uh, if, you, if you had a load curve, a load history, to find out what maybe the strain history would look like. Uh, and then the, maybe the total plastic strain accumulation would be uh, in that case.